and the doctor started me on, so I thought I'd better come in and see you. Yeah, okay, well we might check your blood pressure, Nancy, and see how it is. Oh, okay. How's the family? Oh, yeah, no, they're good. Yeah, yeah. Now, you washed your hands, oh, Cassandra. You know, always got me oh. trusty with me. You just That's <laughs> right, you've got to wash your hands. You know, you know what happened to Donald, don't you? <gasps> so, terrible story. You've got to wash your hands yes. before you touch me. Okay. 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 Yeah, can I get your coat off, Nancy? Okay. Oh, you alright? Yeah. Just sit down. Would that be okay? Yeah, that's fine. Feeling dizzy all the time? Just okay? No, you've got to get up in the morning. Okay. How long have you been on the new medication? Oh, well, the doctor said I'd spend about what a week. Oh, okay. Very long ago. No, so he said I, you know, if I get dizzy or anything, I've got to come and get it checked out. So. I don't want to fall over. No, no, no. No. Break your hip or... No, mm. no. It's a shock and go. Yeah. Shock and go. I don't mind. Look at my hair. Yeah. Oh, God. Nancy. Hold on a sec. Oh, no, no, it's a bit low, Nancy. Do I have to see the doctor again? Yeah, we yeah. are. Oh. all the way basically from California over in Hollywood um, and she is extremely heavy. She's also very hot and very sweary, sweaty and uncomfortable if you, be, you know, keep her on for a long time. So Sandra, how did that feel for you? Um, like we with Monica, like mm. So what did everyone else think about that? What did it make you feel about Nancy sitting here? I will admit I, she's Odd looking, I admit that. <laughs> Unfortunately, that that is the way that she has been much. So she does get a couple of unfortunate looks. But I have to say, I've also had the reaction that it's it's not you, Monica. We know it's you, but I can't say anything because that's Nancy. So if I actually say anything, I'm going to hurt Nancy's feelings. Okay. So you, the the approach behind this is called mask ed. And the approach is it's masking the educator. So what you're actually doing is there is an expert in the room. The expert knows what the learner needs to know. And so they're the guides. They guide the student down that pathway. So then you actually derobe, take the mask off, and you debrief as the expert. And that's what this is all about. The other thing is it really is meant to actually engage learners. Because you can imagine if that's me sitting in the chair, it's completely different. Whereas when it's Nancy, I love, I love her because she's a character. Nancy is actually, um, she's a retired nurse because they actually also have to have a reason to come back into the program. They can't just turn up out of the blue. They have to actually have a reason to teach. Um, so she is actually a retired nurse. So she has this um, passion about it because her husband, who was a surgeon, 
um, actually died from an adverse event in a healthcare institution. So she, her passion is patient safety. So she comes back and teaches all things about patient safety, hence hand washing and all that sort of stuff. So she will pick up students on that sort of stuff. If they don't check my ID band when they give a medication or they don't actually check in my consent if I'm going to have a procedure or something like that, Nancy will stop them and say, hang on a second. Okay. So that was just one thing to actually sort of show you a little bit about what simulation is. Um, I suppose there's, there's many definitions now that are around there around simulation and then we have a governing body in particularly in healthcare simulation where we actually, and that's a society, society for simulation in healthcare and they have actually got this definition about what simulation actually is. Okay, and that it's the imitation or representation of one act or system by another. Now, at the moment, we actually know that there's, there's this huge growth in particularly healthcare-based simulation. It is exponential at the moment. Um, and because of that, there are many institutions and lots of stuff are also faced with this dilemma of what is this simulation about, what's it going to mean for them and all that sort of stuff. So here at Latrobe, we've actually also got together a bit of an expert advisory group trying to explore what does this actually mean for this faculty in particular and trying to get together and work out what are we going to do about this, what resources will it need, what planning is it going to need and all that sort of stuff. So we've actually really grappled with this, what is this definition of simulation and this is still a work in progress. It is not finished or anything like that. So what we've actually come up with so far is that it's a guided interactive activity that replicates or amplifies real experiences. It can be used in teaching, learning, research and rehearsal, investigation, reenactment and debriefing. So there's lots of possible applications for simulation. Um, and it can be used to evoke legitimate responses so that reality can be better understood, managed and practiced. And so far that's as far as we have got. And it took us quite a long time to even come up with those words. So, there's been quite a bit of research, particularly in the last couple of years, about what are some of these outcomes from learning through simulation activities. Um, and now research findings, it was a lot, uh, previously, before we go on there, it was actually a proposed, this is what we think learning through simulation is going to actually produce. But now they're actually starting to say that this research into learning through simulation is actually really starting to show some definite outcomes. And we've actually got, you know, there's increased confidence. We actually can now demonstrate that there is in increased cognitive outcomes from learning through simulation compared to other more traditional forms of teaching and learning. We can actually show that particularly along the lines with communication, um, clinical reasoning, decision making, those sort of skills are really fantastic um, and work really well when you apply learning through simulation. So it's shown that this learning through simulation has benefits. There are increased learning outcomes when you're using it. So what does that actually mean? So where we need to start thinking about this curriculum thing and how does simulation and learning through simulation start to fit with this curriculum? So if we look at what would have been a traditional sort of approach, and I'm taking this perhaps from a nursing background predominantly because that's my history, um, we're looking more at sort of like the lectures. We've got, and whether it's a lecture, it's a video, it's a podcast, whatever you want to do, what we're doing here is actually developing up our foundational knowledge. So then we're going to use a workshop, a tutor or something like that where we're going to actually start to this exploration, examining, probing, applying stuff. Does it fit here? Does it work there? That sort of stuff. And we want to do that when we start to you know, see what happens in a clinical situation. And then we have our clinical skills where we're actually doing task-based stuff. We're actually looking at the clinical skills, we're connecting syringes and needles and actually learning how to draw up drugs. And then they go out onto clinical and it all gets pushed and mashed together. So they integrate all that knowledge out there um, and that's the first time they really get a chance to actually roll it all into one. And that would have been sort of like a traditional journey. It might change a little bit every now and then, but that's a sort of like a traditional format that they would have. Then we did actually have online learning came in. So then we thought, oh, this is great. Add a nice little layer of complexity here. We can add some layers and we can get, oh, you might be able to do something perhaps before they come to the lecture. So now they'll understand what I'm talking about. Then we can actually, well, now they've actually got to apply the stuff that I tell them 
um, after the lecture, before the workshop, so then we can even get more further advanced. And now I can even give them a video and other things to do before they come to the lab. So then they're even you know, more prepared for that. But if we start thinking about learning through simulation and where it might fit and the benefits that it might have, we get a bit of a different picture. And it's a little bit more intricate and a bit more complex. So to develop up foundational knowledge, can we use your learning through simulation for that? Absolutely. And I've seen many times that mannequins are taken into lecture theatres and physiology is demonstrated on quite a high-tech mannequin. What happens if you drop a blood pressure? What then happens to the patient's pulse and respiration? The mannequins will do it automatically. So they will demonstrate that for you. The other things that we can actually start thinking about is this learning through simulation can actually be for students an opportunity for them to assess their own learning needs and see what is it that I need to know to be able to look after a patient in this sort of situation. The challenge with that though is we don't want to actually set learners up to fail. And quite often putting them in something like in a hands-on simulated learning session may cause that to happen and we, you need to be very considerate about how you actually do that. So in a workshop, so when we go and do this exploring and refining, we really make, need to make sure we have really tailor-made, well-designed activities. So if you're going to do a role play, it's not like at the start of the trip. You know, you can be a 43-year-old woman. She's got breast cancer. I don't know how many times I've actually seen that done. And people go, that's a role play. That's not a role play. That is not a role play. A role play is scripted. There are things that you actually need to act out. They are well designed, well written out activities and you can't just spring it on someone. The other thing is, so when we actually do our clinical skills, we now need to start thinking about different layers of clinical skills. So we not only have the technical skills which is connecting up the needles and the syringes and doing all that sort of stuff, but we also now have this layer of non-technical skills. This communication, decision making, leadership, all those sorts of things that come in with that as well. So by, by using these learning through simulations, we can actually have technical skills, we can have non-technical skills, and we roll them into what we call procedural skills. So procedural skills is looking after a patient with an IV. So it's not, it's not caring for an IV, that's not where it's looking after a patient with an IV, which is a little bit different. And then we can actually have this opportunity to do this thing about learning through simulation where we actually get an opportunity so students can actually integrate everything they've done before. So all the knowledge from HBA, HBB, everything gets an opportunity to be rolled into one thing before they even hit a real patient. And we should be getting the students to actually practice all this stuff before they go out into clinical because of the patient safety risks and things like that that they're going to face. And learning through simulation has huge applications for that. We then have clinical placements where students will go out and they'll do their refinement and consolidation. So it's not really a lot of new stuff shouldn't really be happening on clinical placements. Will it? Yeah, it probably will, They'll, but it shouldn't be all new stuff. And then we can actually get them to come back again. And we can do some more simulation. So we actually do some debriefing and we do some review instead of just saying, see ya and don't actually get to talk to them again. It's really, really nice to actually see how to go, what did you learn, and then they can get to refine, well, oh, can we just do one of those simulations again, because I just can't remember how that worked. So, you start to think about where this starts to fit within your curriculum. You now need to start about thinking about what are the approaches and what are the methods that you're actually going to be using. Because we call it using fit for purpose. So if you're depending on what your learning outcome is going to be, it depends on what is the approach and the method that you're actually going to be using. So we can use your simple anatomical models, part task trainers and lots of stuff, right up onto your very high end, dynamic, computer based, very expensive mannequins that have everything computer generated. So if you put oxygen on them, they will respond accordingly. If you give them a drug, everything will just respond and they are obviously very expensive. We also have just your individual trainers, so it could be just an IV cannulation arm, a podiatrist foot, something like that. 
up until huge platforms for huge in group interaction. So Second Life is a big, big one of this, and there's huge simulation labs within Second Life itself, where they do things like team training and all that sort of stuff as well. And we have, they call it obviously low tech standardised mark ed patient, but the highest reality form of simulation up to your really high tech virtual realities. And these are the ones that have haptic feedback. So these are the surgical simulators where surgeons will come in and practice things when they actually get feedback through the actual handsets and everything that they actually use. So you need to start thinking about what's the actual simulator that you're actually going to be using. <laughs> but you also need to think about the approach of the actual simulation. And we differentiate those because they are quite different. So you can actually use what we call a pause and discuss approach. So pause and discuss is where Nancy would have come in, she would have sat down, and at that time the facilitator said, okay, let's pause for a moment, take a bit of a time out, let's chat. So what have you noticed? So Nancy, she's just started on some antihypertensive. She's a bit, she's got postural hypertension when she gets up in the morning. What's the link? So he's discussing what the link is there. Then you go, okay, let's go back and start again. So you go back into the simulation and you keep on going. And so you keep pulling these timeouts all the time. That compared to one where it's, we call fully immersive. And this is the one you just start it and you finish it and it goes where it will go. Okay, and that is, so there are the consequences of the decisions that are actually made in the scenario. You have simulated patient methodology, which is a little bit different. And you can use pause and discuss and immersive approaches, but the way you interact with the simulated patient is quite different, up until mannequin-based simulations. And you can also use single professional simulations and now we're doing lots of interprofessional work with lots of team-based work and things like that. Oh, okay. And the biggest part about simulation is that we actually need to think about this debriefing aspect and what sort of this approach to debriefing. We need to think about it. if you're going to use part task stuff, it might be using just feedback or is it going to be a fully student-led debriefing episode. Lots of challenges that we've sort of experienced so far. So far, very labour intensive, expensive. But once you've got it set up, you can actually reuse lots of the resources, like Nancy. Now that we've actually got Nancy, Nancy can be applied in lots of different settings and things like that. Um, staff development, getting people up to speed about what this approach is all about um, and things like that. The other thing is. It's also more about getting access to equipment and things like that. Um, it's getting access to people who know how to use the equipment. Uh, it's getting access to the actual spaces. So there's lots of challenges around it. But they're saying now that the learning outcomes are actually showing that there's lots of benefits as well. The only other thing would be using simulation for assessment. And just very briefly, they're actually saying now, this is a new publication that's just come out in the last month. Um, this is in from Cook, and as they're saying, assessments that rely on self-report, log books, hours of training, written tests to determine clinical competence will no longer suffice. And what we really need to start looking at is valid assessments that we show we can actually have these learners have the required proficiency, proficiencies for safe and competent practice. And we actually start to see now that so simulation can be used for quite high stakes and quite sort of um, as informative, summative types of assessment where you're actually for certification and things like that. And they actually do this in the US. They're quite often many anaesthetists and they actually have to come back regularly and actually are certified as being competent still. And so it's a, a new burgeoning area for Australia because they're actually looking at certification and things like that here now as well. Um, there's lots of things actually happening at the moment here in Victoria. There's lots of money being spent on this learning through simulation approaches and there's many resources that are being developed. So many virtual based resources and things like that um, about how you can actually... And the thing about simulation now, it's not sort of like a, a bit of a blanket approach anymore. People are being very targeted about it. It's a specific approach, a specific 
method of simulation to develop up a specific type of skill, whether it's non-technical skill, whether it's a technical skill, there is a specific approach that you actually use to develop that up. And now we're becoming very targeted about which approach should be used for which. That's about it from me.